Section 15 of My Strange Rescue. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Betty B. My Strange Rescue by James MacDonald Oxley. Snowshoeing. Three things have the red children of the forest given to the white children of the cities, which are so perfect in their way that it is hardly possible there will ever be an invention filed in the pigeonholes of the patent office that will surpass them. The canoe for shallow water and what might be called cross-country navigation, the toboggan and the snowshoe for deep snow seem to be the very crown of human ingenuity even though they are only the devices of ignorant Indians. One cannot help a feeling of hearty admiration when looking at them and noting how perfectly they fulfill the purpose for which they were designed, and are at the same time as light, graceful, and artistic in form and fashion as the most finished work of highly civilized folk. They all follow the line of beauty so closely that it is no wonder the ladies love to decorate their drawing rooms and boudoirs with them, or to have their pins and brooches modeled after them. To the Indian, the canoe, snowshoe, and toboggan were quite as important implements as the spade, the plow, and the rake are to the farmer. Without them, he could not in winter time have roamed the snow-buried forests, whose recesses supplied his table, or voyaged in the summertime upon the broad rivers and swift-running streams, whose bountiful waters furnished him their ready toll of fish. His white brother has, in adopting them, put them to a different use. He had no particular need for them in his work, but he was quick to see how they would help him in his play, and ere long they had all three become favorite means of sport and recreation. Snowshoeing disputes with tobogganing the honor of being Canada's national winter sport, for although snowshoes have been seen in Siberia and Tartary and are used to some extent in Scandinavia, in none of these places do the people derive much amusement from them. Simple as the snowshoe seems, I would not advise anyone to try to make a pair for himself. Only the Indians can do this really well. And even in Canada, the vast majority of shoes are put together by dusky hands. This is how they make a shoe of three foot six inches, which is a fair average size. A piece of light ash about half an inch thick and at least 90 inches in length is bent to a long oval until the two ends touch, when they are lashed strongly together with catgut. Two strips of tough wood, about an inch broad, are then fitted across this frame, one being placed about five inches from the curving top, the other some twenty inches from the tapering end. The object of these strips is to give both strength and spring to the shoe. The three sections into which the interior of the frame has thus been divided are then woven across with catgut, each having a different degree of fineness in the mesh, the top section being very fine, the middle section, upon which almost the whole strain comes, coarse and strong, and the end section, a medium grade between the other two. The gut in the middle section is wound right around the framework for the sake of greater strength, but in the other two is threaded through holes bored at intervals of an inch or so. Just behind the front crossbar, an opening, about four inches square, is left in the gut netting, in order to allow free play for the toes in lifting the shoe at each step. Both wood and gut must be thoroughly seasoned, or else the one will warp, and the other stretch and sag until the shoe is altogether useless. The shoes are made in many shapes and of many sizes, ranging from two to six feet in length, and from ten to twenty inches in breadth. But for all practical purposes, a shoe measuring 3 feet 6 inches by 12 or 15 inches is the best. In racing, narrower shoes are used, but they rarely go below 10 inches, that being the regulation measurement for club competitions. Then again, some snowshoes are turned up in front like tiny toboggans, instead of being flat, this kind being worn principally by ladies. And now, supposing that we have a pair of shoes entirely to our satisfaction, let us constitute ourselves members of a snowshoe club and take a tramp with it. Snowshoeing is immensely popular in Montreal, 
as all visitors to the Winter Carnival well know. There are 20 or more organized clubs there, the membership in most cases being rigidly confined to the masculine gender. And every fine night in the week, all winter long, some club or other has a meet. Discipline is pretty strictly enforced at these club tramps, and seeing how earnestly the members go about the business, an onlooker might well be pardoned for thinking that there was quite as much work as play in this particular amusement. The pace set and the distance traveled are beyond the powers of beginners, so that unless one is willing to stand a good deal of merciless chafing and have a pretty hard time of it altogether, it is better to wait until fairly familiar with the use of the raquet, the French name for the snowshoe, before joining a club. Let us imagine, then, that it is one of those glorious nights in midwinter when this dull old earth of ours seems transformed into fairyland. The snow lies in white depths upon the ground, dry and firm as ocean sand. Jack Frost has brought the mercury away down some points below zero, and the keen air sets every nerve a tingle. A superb full-orbed moon swings high in the heavens, flooding the wintry world with her silver splendor, and a hundred active muscular young fellows have gathered at the rendezvous, clothed in white blanket coats with rainbow borders, brilliant blue sashes and toques, conical knitted caps sacred to snowshoeing, knickerbockers of the same material as the coats and stockings of the same color as the sashes, while on their feet are soft moccasins skillfully decorated by Indian fingers. Sharp on time, the club captain arrives and in a trice all hands are down upon their knees, fastening the raquet to their feet. Are you all ready, shouts the captain. A hearty chorus of aye aye rings out on the keen air. Off then, he answers, striding rapidly away, his followers stringing out in a long line behind, for the walking is always done in Indian file, and they set forth to attack the mountain, which towers up so grandly behind the city, forming one of the finest parks in the world. The line of march is made up very simply. The captain who was selected for that much coveted position because he was renowned for speed and endurance, as well as his knowledge of the best routes, takes the lead. The rank and file follow in any order they please, and the rear is brought up by the whipper in. Although the post of whipper in is not much coveted, that officer ranks next in importance to the captain, and should be one of the strongest and most experienced members in the club. His really arduous duties are to quicken up the laggards, assist the unfortunate, and inspire the despondent, for upon him it depends to have the club all in together at the end of the tramp, wending along the snow-covered, tree-bordered paths, or diving deep into the forest where there are no paths at all. The long, thin line climbs steadily upward, growing longer as the steep ascent begins to tell upon the weaker ones, and they lag behind. At length the summit is reached, and a halt is called for a few minutes, that the panting, perspiring climbers may get their breath and close up the gaps in their ranks. All up, inquires the captain. All up, is the cheery response. Then forward, and off they go again, this time down instead of up, with head thrown back, shoulders braced firmly, muscles at high tension, and eyes alert for dangers in the shape of hidden stumps or treacherous tree branches. Faster and faster grows the pace, as the impetus of the decline is more and more felt. The shoes rattle like castanets, and the long line of white-coated, blue-capped figures undulates in and out among the tree clumps, appearing, vanishing, and reappearing like some monstrous serpent in full chase after its prey. Ha! What's that? A fence right across the path? What is to be done now? The leader soon answers this question, for over the obstacle he goes as lightly as a bird, and his followers imitate him as best they may, some being content to crawl gingerly across by dint of hands and knees. One luckless wight, tripping on the top, takes a sudden header into the snowbank on the other side, leaving only a pair of legs in sight to mark the place of his downfall. But the whipper in comes to the rescue and soon has him on his shoes again. What between fences, hedges, ditches, and other difficulties, the line is far from being well kept up. Gaps are frequent and wide. Some have fallen and lost time in getting upright. Others have been outstripped, 
But the leaders, like time and tide, wait for no man, and soon the welcome lights of the clubhouse, nestling in the valley, flash cheeringly across the snow. Then the captain pauses a few minutes, that those who have been distanced may regain their places, and all being once more together, a final spurt at racing speed brings them with shouts of joy and sighs of relief to their goal. Here shoes are slipped off tired feet, coats and toques thrown gleefully aside, and parched mouths cooled with refreshing drinks. An hour or more is spent in rest and frolic, and then the return journey made by the well-beaten road with the shoes strapped upon the back. The distance across the mountain is nearly three miles, yet it has been done by an amateur in 16 minutes, 28 seconds, which considering the nature of the course is remarkably good going. The best amateur time for 100 yards on the flat is 12 and a half seconds, so that, clumsy and cumbersome as the raquet may seem at first glance, they are really a very slight bar to speed when the wearer is thoroughly expert in their use. Hare and hounds on snowshoes is a sport that must commend itself to all strong and vigorous boys who have a taste for cross-country work, if only for the reason that the snowshoes make the sport possible at a time when it would otherwise be out of the question. The hare can be followed by his tracks, thus doing away with the necessity of carrying cumbrous bags of paper scent. Snowshoeing differs from many other sports in being very easy to learn. Once you have mastered the art of sliding one shoe over the other with very much the same motion that you would make in skating, instead of lifting it up high as though you were wading in deep snow, as you are sure to do at first, once you properly understand this, your chief difficulty is conquered, and proficiency comes with a little practice. Throughout the length and breadth of Canada, snowshoeing is popular with young and old. Every center of population has its clubs. Competitions are held every winter at which tempting prizes are offered to the winners in races at different distances, from 100 yards up to 10 miles. End of section 15.